Thanks for your help, everyone. Sorry about the technical difficulties earlier. Um, I'm just going to get rid of these banners and we can go ahead with the next talk. Uh, once again, a reminder, please ask questions um, in the chat and we'll look forward to this talk from Francois. Okay, thanks for your patience, everyone. Just have another minute to wait. You can ask me questions too. I'll, I'll be on the chat program in the break. Okay. Project manager at Camp to Camp. I live in. Hi, this is Francois van der Biest. Uh, I am project manager at Camp to Camp. I live in Chambéry in France and I will be presenting you today this talk where we will be speaking about lowering the barrier to entry into SDI, where SDI stands for, of course, spatial data infrastructure, uh, with the motto that metadata has to be fun. My co-presenters will be Florent Gravin and Gabriel Roldan. So, where do we come from in terms of metadata? This is a metadata editing form taken from GeoNetwork. You may know it. Well, it's part of a metadata editing for form, in fact. Maybe just a fifth of it. Yeah. It's not very funny, you, you, we have to admit it. So the question is, how do you convince users to put their data into your SDI if they have to spend their precious time filling obscure metadata fields? So we try to make it easier at camp to camp for busy people mostly. So yeah, so the global idea is that people will just have to drag and drop their geodata on the application, check everything's correct, answer a few easy questions, and leave it, leave it running. So to this extent, we combine data upload and metadata editing into a single point. We leverage already known and inferable information from the dataset which has been uploaded so as to reduce the things which have to be filled by the user. And we also try to gamify the user experience. So by gamifying, we mean that user gets immediate feedback of what's going on under the hood. But we will show it very soon. So we took advantage of an existing SDI to perform this. We chose GeoOrchestra for its robustness. And by robustness, I mean it powers tens of important SDIs around the world. For instance, at Deutsche Telekom in Bolivia, and there are also several French regions and major cities who are running it in the cloud or on-premises. We also value Geoxtra for its modularity. And by modularity, I mean there's a core made of Geo server, Geo network, and security proxy, CAS, etc. And this is the core in Geoxtra. And then it's a, I would say, pick your apps approach. For instance, there are several viewers several map store extensions, tens of geo server extensions, and so on. And to be more complete, we are currently thinking about adding QGIS server to the bundle. Yes, since it's a service-oriented approach, everything's possible. And GeoOrchestra also has APIs, uh, which are offered by the core apps, geo server and geo network, which which make it possible to have this integrated approach that we have with uh, 
data feed or application. So what is GeoOrchestra in a few words? GeoOrchestra is a modular SDI which was born in 2009 in France to meet the inspired directive, which is well known in Europe. It is built, as I said, around GeoServer, GeoNetwork and a CAS, SSO. And it also provides visualization, extraction and administration functionality. So it's great to have this modular approach, taking the best of each module, GeoServer, GeoNetwork. We are standing on the shoulders of giants, but it comes at a price sometimes. And the price is currently for the users to pay. They have to upload data using either Nextcloud or SSH, go to GeoServer UI, create a store, a layer, go to GeoNetwork, create their metadata, and then grant rights. So in this talk, I'll present the data feeder module, as we call it, which fixes this precise issue. Here it is. So as you see, it's a slick application. Made, it's made with Spring Boot and Angular the, for the front end. And you see there is my login on the top right corner. So it requires you to be connected to the SDI uh, in order to, to work efficiently. So next step is the demonstration. So here is the application, you see. Let me show you first that I am connected. If I share, if I show you the user details, what is known for my users, for my user which is currently connected, you can see that the SDI knows my name, my mail, my job title, eventually my phone, and organization. I belong to Camp to Camp. It also, it's also aware of the other members from the team. And that's it for now. So I'd like to upload my data for the moment. I can only share with the data feeder shape files, but we have plans to do more. Uh, it's a version zero. So let's share with the application a zip file, which was taken from an open data site from Paris. Okay, let's share it. Oh no, sorry, I forgot. I forgot to click the, the checkbox. I hold the right to publish this data set. Yes. Okay. Thanks for reminding me this. Next step is I'm being shown the data set extent with its spatial reference system. And also one can see the number of entities provided in the data set on the right. On side, you can see a sample entity from the data set with its attribute table, a sample of it. From here, I can change the encoding if required, but it seems there is no, no need to do that. Okay, my data are correct. Let's go to the next step, that's a wizard. So the best title I can give for this data set is Sunnyset Paris. I would say it's been filled, collected by agents, I'd say. Next step is to select tags taken from a thesaurus. Which one can I take? This one is uh, utilities. When was it created? Okay, let's say it was created the 1st July this year. It was created for the scale. Okay, let's say it was field collected with Q field. Next. Okay, we're almost there. Here is a, a, a resume of what uh, I've filled in the metadata editing form. If I agree with it, I can submit it or I've, I can go back. Let's say it's, it's OK, I submit. And then there you see it's talking with GeoServer and GeoNetwork in the background to create a, 
the data and the metadata. So I can, let's have a look at the metadata record. So it's powered by GeoNetwork. Okay, you see the metadata, the metadata sheet with all the information we collected with uh, my point of contact. The point of contact is a user which is connected with my organization, language, categories, inspired terms, and so on. It's okay for the metadata, and let's see it in the map viewer. You see it, uh, it directs you to GeoServer, GeoServer demo page for the layer we created. So it basically shows that it is now available. This layer is now available in the WMS service provided by GeoServer under this workspace, this Camp to Camp workspace. So great. And I have the option to upload another dataset. Let's do it. Let's try to upload some junk, junk, junk zip, uh, zip file, which is corrupted, for instance. Let's try. Oh, no, it doesn't work. <laughs> oh, oh, surprising. Uh, now let's upload another zip file, this, this time without projection information. OK, the system detects that the projection system is unknown and we get the opportunity to fix it. Is it Web Mercator? It's not. Is it Lambert 93? It's not. Is it WS 84? It seems so, according to the geometries in the dataset. It looks like they are correctly positioned when we choose WGS 84. As like previously, <coughs> a sample entity from the dataset is being shown and we have the opportunity at this step to check that the encoding is correct. If it's not, you can change it and you see if I change a French, if I change the encoding to a French encoding, it's not correct. So I'm pretty sure now that it's UTF-8. Okay, my data are correct. And let's go on. Okay, I won't go through the other screens because it's the same as the first ones, but trust me, it works. So how do we create create an ISO metadata field, um, an ISO metadata sheet with so little fields? The fact is we overlay information from different sources. Uh, at the bottom, you have a metadata template, which is provided by the platform administrator. And on top of this template, we overlay information from what we know from the uploaded data set, the number of features, uh, the, uh, the um, spatial reference system, sorry. <laughs> uh, we also know which user is connected. So this is the contact point. We also have information from the publication process, for instance, the date, the timestamp where the submission process started. And of course, all the information collected through the publication wizard. Then you may ask where, where are the data stored once it is uploaded? The answer is that we do not keep it uh, in its original format. Instead, we convert it to PostgreSQL, PostGIS, and we store it in a dedicated table schema, and in a dedicated table, of course. And the schema is named by the publishing organization name. So we keep things very tidy and organized in the database. And in GeoServer, the, we create, if required, a workspace, a workspace for the organization of the uploading user, also a store if it does not previously exist, and we prefer GNDI stores. So the application lets you 
gives you the ability to, to have a GNDI stores, which is to be preferred if this data is to be used for production. And of course, we always create a new layer. So, you may ask now if we created the links between data and metadata. Of course we did. We took advantage of the fact that we created both resources at the same time to edit those links so that the, metadata, so the data knows where the metadata stands. And we did the same also for the metadata. As you see here, the metadata knows where the data is stored. And as a result, we get the opportunity to extract this data directly from the catalog. Also, speaking of privileges, the metadata belongs to the publishing organization. What about GeoServer regarding ACLs, ACLs? So the data feeder does not take ACLs into account for now, which means that the rules which were previously defined by the platform administrator remain. And for GeoServer, these are, for instance, the layer security rules and the service security rules. So with the layer security rules and mostly the workspace specific rules, the administrator has the opportunity to secure the layers which will be uploaded for each organization. Also the global rules still apply, but the workspace rules come on top of them and they overwrite them. So what about the technical stuff for the data feeder? So server side, it's a collection of Spring Boot, Spring Batch, GeoTools, of course, and we make use of GeoServer and GeoNetwork REST clients, of course, to push the data and metadata to GeoServer and GeoNetwork backends. On the client side, we have GeoNetwork UI, which is this brand new library uh, which resides in the GeoNetwork organization, GitHub organization, and which is meant to provide new components for catalog UIs, web components, I mean. And it's built on Angular. Okay? So, of course, sharing is caring. We share the data feeder, it belongs to GeoOrchestra. And GeoOrchestra is licensed GPL v3. Also, all UI components have been pushed to GeoNetwork UI, which is GPL v2. And developing this uh, data feeder application, we also uh, contributed this GeoServer Java REST client to GeoServer. And so it's now, it now belongs to GeoServer main repository and stored with uh, GeoServer, the same license, which is GPLv2, if I'm not mistaken. So, how do you get it? The best way to try it out is Docker. We have a GitHub repository to test it and by cloning, cloning it and running Docker Compose, you will get the data feeder and GeoOrchestra running in your laptop, on your laptop, in a few moments, namely in five to ten minutes. This is the URL where you will be able to access a data feeder application. So what's next for the data feeder? We'd like to improve several topics. For instance, uh, handling the full data and metadata editing cycle. It, this has been asked us by several people, but we do not have funding for now for it. We also would like to support more input formats, for instance, GeoPackage. Also, open data, which is a global trend, 
which means no geo file, would be nice to be able to handle. For instance, PDF files. And raster support. Why not supporting raster? For instance, I'd like you to be able to upload a TIFF file and we transform it on the fly to COG, for instance, and eventually uploading, to it, uploading it to any object storage at the same time. That would be awesome. So I'd like to thank you, thank you all, all of you, the GEO community, for sharing the awesome stuff we rely on for this application and the other ones. Also, I'd like to share my team, Florent Gravin, Gabriel Roldan, Olivier Guyot, Pierre Mauduit, Björn Hoffling, Antoine Apt and Yuri, who made it possible. Thank you all. Also, I'd like to thank the French department of the Haute-Loire for their financial support to develop the data feeder application. This comes to an end. If you want to reach me, feel free to reach me at this email or on Twitter at fvanderbeest. And you can also read our blog post